Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Roland. Um, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to our AI readiness uh, webinar. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, I will be talking about the step six of the ethical AI framework, um, which uh, is focusing on educators and particularly trying to explore what the main AI techniques that we have covered um, are telling us uh, or what kind of insights they can help us generate from the data uh, that we have collected. Uh, so more specifically uh, in this webinar, I will be talking about the promise of AI in education for educators and, um, and explore the types of findings that AI can potentially reveal in educational settings, describe um, how some of the results of the AI techniques applied in step five of the framework uh, can be used in educational settings, and present and discuss some of the recent AI in education examples, uh, both from research and practice, mainly focusing on practice rather than research. Um, I wanted to remind uh, our audience once again that this is not a research webinar. Um, it is specifically designed um, uh, for um, uh, educators, people who are interested in the practice and, and use of AI in, in, in educational uh, practice. Um, so this, uh, uh, we know from experience uh, that um, the, the, the um, use of AI solutions and their adoption uh, requires certain level of understanding from the um, educational organization itself and, and the people who are working uh, on it. Um, so we try to make it as accessible as possible, not really getting into the actual uh, details of the uh, techniques and, and methods. I'm very happy uh, today I will be joined uh, by Timo Hani, as mentioned by Roland, uh, who is the founder of School Dash. And for those who are not familiar with School Dash, please have a look at the uh, website. It helps people and organizations to understand education through data. Uh, they work with consultancies, charities, companies, um, and, and to enable them to make uh, generate insights uh, uh, through the use of data in, in educational uh, uh, settings. Um, Timo will present a few examples uh, towards the end of the um, uh, um, webinar, and we will discuss the potential of data and AI in education. So really looking forward to this. Um, so who are we? Um, so for, the, for those people who are joining uh, us regularly now might be familiar. Um, we are Rozakin, Karma Kent, Benedict de Boulay, um, Mohamed Ali Shadri, Anisla Mohini, Ibrahim Bashir, and myself, Mutlaf um, Rova. Uh, all of us have relevant backgrounds and complementary backgrounds in learning sciences, AI and education, and, and data science. In our work, we are following the seven steps of the AI readiness uh, framework. Um, this is an iterative step-by-step -step guide uh, to prepare educators and educational organizations to leverage the power uh, of data and AI uh, to address some of their um, uh, current challenges that they are facing. Um, and um, you might have already attended uh, some of the webinars earlier. We have covered the first five steps, uh, looking at the motivation and increasing the um, enthusiasm of the users, tailoring and honing the, the challenge that we would like to address, identifying the data sources, collecting relevant data and collecting them, applying AI techniques uh, to this data. And today we will be looking at some of the things that we can potentially learn in educational settings in the implementations of, of AI. Um, so AI has a lot to offer to education and, and the findings um, uh, from um, data uh, that is processed by AI uh, can help us address significant challenges of education. And I tried to, in this part of this webinar, um, categorize them in, in four themes. Uh, the first theme is um, um, AI helping us uh, uh, providing access to education. Um, the second theme is helping us decreasing teacher workload, potentially helping us uh, personalizing uh, education with right on time, uh, just in time instruction and, and feedback to increase the effectiveness of education. Um, and uh, the last theme focusing on AI helping us discover uh, new findings about learning and the learning process and all learners uh, themselves and their behaviors. And it's really important to uh, kind of emphasize at this stage that these themes are 
really touching upon some of the greatest challenges that the education systems are uh, currently facing and have been facing for a, a long time. So um, more than um, 262 million um, youth and children didn't have access to uh, education globally uh, in the school year ending 2017. Um, and with the ongoing pandemic, providing access to education has become the priority of every country and every education system. And even when the access is provided, um, uh, uh, pre-pandemic conditions, more than 617 million students didn't achieve uh, the minimum proficiency levels of maths and reading um, uh, tests. So the quality of the education provided has been a significant challenge. Um, in addition to these, uh, the teacher workload has been one of the most significant issues um, that uh, is causing um, problems to retain the uh, existing workforce um, uh, and to retain qualified teachers in education systems, uh, which is a, a, again a, a global concern uh, because even if we were to deliver what we were delivering in education systems uh, within the pre-pandemic uh, context, by 2030 we would need more than 69 new teachers. So uh, AI um, uh, and data uh, uh, has potential to touch upon some of the key challenges um, and, and generate insights uh, uh, potentially with regards to some of these key challenges in, in education systems. Okay, let's dive in uh, to these themes. Um, starting from the access to education, um, the, um, perhaps from the research uh, and existing available evidence point of view, access to education is the most straightforward argument that uh, can be made in terms of the value uh, of, of AI uh, to, to, to education. Obviously, access to education is not necessarily uh, uh, mean uh, uh, that, that good quality education will be provided, uh, but access is a necessary yet not sufficient uh, condition uh, uh, for effective learning. So um, it's relatively easy to judge to what extent learners are um, uh, having access to an AI platform uh, or not, uh, but we should not forget that uh, it doesn't always equate to, to learning. So there are very, um, you know, large number of uh, examples uh, that are currently increasing uh, that is providing uh, access to education globally. But I chose this particular uh, example from China um, and mainly because of the scale of access that they are providing. And just to give a brief idea, there are about 200 million K-12 students in, in China, and a big portion of these is uh, 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 living in remote areas. Um, and frequent reports show the uh, significant difference uh, uh, of the learners' achievements in remote areas compared to the central and urban, urban areas. Um, so for these people in these kind of contexts, access to education can potentially be provided with AI system. And there are different methodologies and different techniques uh, used to provide such um, uh, AI systems. Uh, but let's have a look at this particular example and how it works. So this particular example is built on various AI uh, theories and, and methods, essentially uh, uh, building upon the graph theory. So there is a knowledge graph uh, of each individual student model, and there is a content graph of the domain that they need to learn um, um, and master. So um, knowledge space theory, item response theory, um, um, uh, all of these available AI techniques that would help us computationally build how the domain would look like um, can be used, and in this particular case, um, are utilized to create a, 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 a graph for the content uh, of a domain, in this case, the math. So you can see here the certain examples of knowledge points that are all related to each other in a multidimensional space, and the content graph provides this um, um, large multidimensional graph of the domain uh, that needs to be mastered. Then, um, using techniques like uh, Bayesian knowledge tracing, which is an algorithm essentially uh, models each learner's mastery of uh, a particular knowledge that they, they are being tutored on. Um, it models uh, student knowledge using um, uh, hidden macro models, like the examples that we had discussed last week uh, briefly, um, essentially uh, treating uh, the student knowledge as a latent variable, non-observable variable, and looking at 
how good they are doing in the, the questions that are being provided or the activities that are being provided on the platform. The system predicts uh, their mastery of um, each individual uh, content. And in this case, the student two, for, student two, for instance, requires um, uh, to improve their mastery level uh, on 20% uh, of the, uh, uh, the topic. Then assuming that each individual student uh, may require different amounts of time to master each individual topic and different students um, actually may require different amounts of time to master the same knowledge point. Um, this content map and the knowledge map is uh, created and built into a multidimensional uh, uh, space. Um, and using some of the classification approaches that we discussed, for instance, logistic regression or uh, classification trees, personalized content recommendations are provided to each individual student and personalized learning paths are recommended to each individual student depending on their master level and what they need to master. So what, what does AI um, uh, teach us here? You know, what does AI, um, what we can learn from AI in these kind of settings is that AI can, and techniques that we can use in AI can help us model the knowledge space we want learners to achieve. Um, it can help us predict the content mastery of each learner for this knowledge space. It can provide recommendations on what to learn next, and it can provide recommendations on how to progress based on students' current knowledge. Um, Another example of access to education is x 5 Gone project, um, which is an EU project led by UCL, and it provides open educational resources um, that are tailored for the needs of individual students, and it adapts the content of open educational resources through machine learning for aggregation, creation, uh, personalization, and creation of, of content. There is not enough time to go through the, every single AI component of the platform, but I strongly suggest that you go and have a look at it because you can play around it and it's freely available as a platform. Um, one aspect of it is uh, uh, what, what is called as the Wikifier. So you can input your text, video, or audio data, and the system uh, is a web service that takes this input and annotates it with uh, links to relevant uh, Wikipedia concepts at the token level, so at the label level, um, and then all of these um, content that is labeled and wikified as, as uh, the system creator calls uh, are stored in a database uh, that also contains user activities. Then this becomes part of a recommendation engine. So whenever you type uh, a, a particular search or, or whenever you uh, type in an entity in the ontology map, it provides relevant um, um, uh, open educational resources from across the globe um, uh, that might be relevant for your uh, needs. Um, the system is multilingual, which, is, um, uh, which means that you can input um, uh, different um, um, resources in different languages. Um, so let's say if an, an, an open educational um, uh, resource is in Spanish, um, the system uses machine learning and natural language processing, which was the last technique we briefly covered last week, um, um, and, and converts the, uh, the, the input uh, resource in, in Spanish and, and transcribes it, then translates it and automatically creates content in English. So you can see the original uh, resource being presented in Spanish, but watch it in, in English. And again, um, the link is provided. Again, the tool is freely available. Uh, you can go around and, 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 and um, familiarize yourself and find out more about this. In addition to providing access, AI systems are actually providing excellent opportunities for observation science. Um, by which what I mean is that we can track and trace interactions of the learners um, in um, um, online platforms and identify what um, actual um, learning interactions are uh, utilized by effective um, uh, learners and which ones are um, uh, ignored um, or what features of the uh, platform uh, are used or which ones um, are most significant predictors of academic success. So in this particular example, I um, have chosen um, 
colleagues uh, looked at the learning management system interactions of students and collated data from different modules. So these are these, each one of these are courses, uh, accounting course, biology one, biology two, um, uh, communication course, and computer science. Um, and each one of these are uh, relevant uh, uh, learning management system interaction uh, spaces that um, the system collects data on. Um, and these are all merged with the uh, course level demographic information and demographic data that has been collected. And then um, using uh, techniques like what we have discussed uh, briefly last week, the multiple linear regression models, the system essentially tries to um, predict what um, data sources are the most significant predictors of academic success. Here it is a regression model trying to predict the grades of the students and um, as you can see those uh, bold uh, highlighted ones are the most significant predictors of a student's grade. In addition to this, uh, a, a relatively um, a, a different approach of, of, of classification uh, was um, uh, used to be able to identify whether they will pass or fail the course uh, using a binary logistic regression analysis, in this case, uh, for each individual uh, uh, modules um, um, uh, and the student interactions uh, in each individual uh, um, uh, course uh, were used to be able to see uh, what kind of interactions are leading to uh, 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 passing behaviors and which ones are leading to uh, failing behaviors. Um, it's interesting to see that in different um, um, courses, in different programs, different um, behaviors were significant predictors of success, which shows that um, uh, uh, cross-context applicability of these kind of models uh, uh, might be quite problematic. Um, I wanted to also mention here, sorry, uh, I went back, that uh, another interesting point to, to, to see was that the predictive power of the AI uh, system and the models built uh, had increased when the interaction data was merged with the demographics data from the students. So uh, there is value in bringing in multiple sources of information. Okay, let's have a look at the second theme of decreasing uh, teacher uh, workload. Uh, hopefully uh, this will go relatively uh, faster. Um, so evidence to decrease teacher workload is not as clear because it's not as easy to measure whether students have access to uh, AI platforms or not. Um, so it might be uh, more about changing educators' practice towards more effective, valuable, or enjoyable activities than total saved time. Um, by which what I mean is that um, the argument of um, decreasing teacher workload uh, might not actually be um, a, a, a standard certain amount of time decrease uh, on, on uh, weekly um, time of, of teaching, but it might be more about changing uh, what, on what activities do teachers actually spend their time. So a very uh, good example of this uh, kind of uh, AI platform is assessment. And um, it's a digital platform that supports students um, uh, during their engagement with um, homework activities or problem solving activities given assigned to them by their teachers. And it helps teachers to assess uh, where the instructional time should focus or how, how the instructional time should be spent. So the teachers uh, are using this built um, uh, setting to create their assignments. They can write their own problems or choose from a pool of problems or use curriculum input. Um, and then the system, uh, while students are trying to solve the, these problems, um, adapts and, and provides scaffolding and hints and messages to the students. So most of the AI is actually um, using when uh, and how this scaffolding and these hints, these hints should be provided to the students. And then teachers receive a report of the classroom performance. So what problems were the most significant problems that uh, a very few number of students were able to solve, how much time they spent on each problem, um, and, and what were the common mistakes that the students made, and create um, reports as suggestions for teachers to shape their instructional time progress in teaching of math. So when they come to the classroom, they actually already have a pretty good idea about the, what they should be focusing on while they are teaching uh, to this particular class. 
Um, in addition to these more complex, um, um, sorry, in addition to these more traditional um, data sources, there are systems that are using uh, data sources and, and uh, extract features from different uh, uh, modalities. For instance, a similar system um, uh, was uh, implemented that also generates features on the uh, student's facial landmarks and head poles uh, using two-dimensional video data in order to be able to potentially uh, model students' emotional states. And these behavioral states um, were still used from the traditional log data, but it was merged with the emotional states of the students to be able to create some kind of an engagement mapping. Um, and these were then created uh, for as dashboards to the teachers, so the teacher could immediately see which students have been struggling for a long time, and they could also click on each individual um, student to be able to see their current emotions as well as their engagement history. So by which what I mean in terms of the change in teachers' practice to save uh, time and what can AI help us to detect uh, is, 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 is uh, uh, literally um, exemplified in this uh, research study uh, where the teacher's use of the, the, the platform was tested. And when the teacher was using this app in her classroom, their time spending uh, behaviors uh, significantly changed. So the teachers who were using this system were spending statistically significantly less amount of time in close monitoring, literally right, going right next to a student and trying to observe whether they're engaged or where are they in their learning uh, uh, stage. They were spending a lot more time, statistically significantly more amount of time on scaffolding activities. Uh, uh, and in, from the student's point of view, they were spending statistically significantly less amount of time in the board stage uh, 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 um, more emotion than uh, the, tr the control condition in which they didn't have the system. So it's not perhaps always about um, um, decreasing the uh, uh, total amount of time, but it's maybe also about helping teachers to, to shape or reshape their practice towards more uh, um, enjoyable, effective, and, and motivational uh, activities. So, the other theme that I want to briefly uh, mention today is the personalized effective education. Um, so there is probably the uh, highest amount of an increasing amount of evidence uh, to support this particular argument in terms of the, what we can learn in AI uh, or from AI and what it can promise to education. Uh, because there's been studied for a long time within the context of intelligent tutoring systems. And although outcome measures of many studies um, for effective education are uh, uh, frequently focusing on the content acquisition, like learning a piece of uh, information or mastering a piece of information. There are also a few other ex examples looking at the improvement on students' metacognition or help seeking uh, behaviors. Um, I think um, the, I will not get into the actual evidence uh, of impact because this is at the individual and meta reviews levels can be found um, uh, pretty straightforward and you can get in touch with me if you are interested in this particular space. But I wanted to do a lot more focus on what does this tell to an educator, like what, what, what can an educator learn out of this? Um, so in this meta-analysis of uh, 107 studies looking at the evaluations, including uh, almost 15,000 uh, participants, uh, these kind of systems uh, effectiveness to, to support greater achievement than large group instruction, non-adaptive uh, computer-based systems, and textbooks have been uh, provided. And there was no significant difference between the learning from an ITS and learning from an individualized um, human tutoring or small group inst instruction. Um, the particular way and means of instruction um, had a little impact on the uh, effect size of the um, uh, adaptive systems uh, 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 input uh, to students' achievement. And this was also studied almost in all levels of education and almost in um, all subject domains. So what, what we can learn uh, of these as educators is that AI is a powerful tool um, and, and it needs, uh, to help us identify individual students' knowledge gaps and support them uh, accordingly. Um, 
And that is really very little to do with the particular techniques of AI. You know, there were studies looking at model tracing, probabilistic modeling, reconstructive bug modeling, or constraint-based modeling. Um, this had very little impact on the effectiveness, but it was much more about uh, for what the model was providing support on. And, and it was shown that the highly individualized task selection prompting why students are interacting with the system and providing response feedback in time uh, were uh, uh, valuable um, uh, features of those systems um, that uh, have been shown to be effective um, uh, at a scale. Um, last theme within the last four uh, minutes or so that I wanted to focus on is AI also has the potential to help us discover about learning, about learners and learning process. And I want to emphasize that this is a lot more on the research side than uh, practice side and a lot more of a high risk, high gain type of investigation. So all of these things that I will be presenting from now on uh, should be uh, taken with a pinch of salt and should be approached cautiously because these are um, relatively preliminary research studies. But um, uh, there's a, a point to be made there in terms of what AI and data can help us uh, um, achieve uh, because there is really good potential of these techniques to help us discover perhaps new findings about how human learning occurs. Um, in a recent system, we have built uh, uh, in, from our own research a multimodal uh, learning analytics system, essentially collects uh, multiple sources of data, looking at students' hand movements, their face data, looking at the physical computing kit inter uh, interactions of the learners, their mobile input, and their self-declared emotional data. And using these data sources, uh, we have been calculating some independent variables. Um, such as the number of faces looking at the screen, uh, mean distance between learners, distance between hands, hand movement speeds, um, audio levels, uh, and all the interaction um, uh, uh, logs from students' work with the physical computing kits. In addition to this, uh, the system was recording the amount of time students uh, were spending on different levels of the project um, uh, and that they spent on planning blue is building and the, the pink is um, uh, uh, um, reflection time and using uh, uh, some of the techniques that we have discussed last week uh, uh, like more traditional uh, naive bayesian approaches or logistic regression or support vector machines as well as some of the uh, more modern uh, aggressive um, uh, deep learning techniques we were trying to uh, estimate the quality of collaboration based on this kind of input data that uh, I have just presented. And we have achieved pretty high accuracy in terms of detecting the collaboration competence based on this input data. But perhaps more importantly, uh, we have identified that certain features um, within the model um, are a lot more uh, predictive and helping us to predict the quality of collaboration better than others. For instance, individual uh, face information or um, um, audio, uh, audio logs data, the physical computing, computing log, log data, hand position data alone had very little effect. Whereas the audio information but, and the distance measures between the learners were really strong predictors of the accuracy of the um, collaboration competence. So, that kind of led us looking at certain features that um, uh, uh, might represent um, what uh, effective collaborative learning look like and, and, and identify certain features that might actually um, um, help us interpret collaborative learning process. And we have observed that the synchrony might actually be a relevant construct to investigate further there because those people who appear to be effectively collaborating also appear to have higher amounts of synchrony in their behaviors. Uh, similarly, I will not really get into the details due to the time. Uh, um, this concept of synchrony were studied uh, within the context of looking at eye gaze uh, behaviors uh, 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 of, of learners. And in this case, AI is uh, helping us to um, synchronize very high frequency uh, granular um, data from the eye tracking devices, as well as helping us detect the individual students' area of interest. 
Um, and emerging research shows that, um, again, those affective groups appear to be synchronized in their um, joint visual attention, in their um, uh, gaze behaviors um, uh, appearing to be overlapping um, uh, more significantly than, than less effective um, uh, collaborating groups. Um, in a, another um, a recent research uh, project, we have been looking at uh, data from multiple sources to interpret effective debating, and we have collected data from 22 different um, uh, dimensions, uh, from survey uh, experience of debating and audio analysis. Then we used uh, a technique that we discussed last week, uh, which is uh, um, a dimension reduction technique called principal component analysis, in order to be able to decrease uh, uh, these 22 dimensions into four, and then we use multinomial logistic regression, again a technique we, we briefly discussed last week, um, uh, to be able to identify what um, um, uh, 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 kind of input data would help us effectively classify those um, candidates that are likely to be uh, 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 effective um, debaters. And in this case, we have also identified that audio data is a very valuable predictor. So that's a, a finding that is worth to investigate further, that um, arousal levels um, during a debate might actually help us uh, understand um, how um, debating uh, works and how effective debating occurs in these kind of uh, contexts. So I would like to sum up uh, by summarizing what an educator can learn from the use of data and AI. Um, so AI can provide access to quality education. Uh, looking at data, an educator might uh, sense the extent of learners' engagement and potentially predict their success in context. And I wanted to emphasize this because it's really not easy to um, cross context, implement uh, these kind of models always. Um, and AI can re help reshape educators' practice by identifying specific problems of their students, which might help them save time um, on um, those more uh, mechanical and monotonous tasks and spend their time on more uh, pedagogically valuable aspects of teaching. AI can help an educator increase their effectiveness of their practice by complementing their practice with adaptive uh, intelligent tutoring systems, and AI can potentially help educators and researchers discover new findings about learning and learners as we have exemplified. Now I'll stop here um, and I'll, I'll um, see if there are any questions, Roland. Uh, yes, uh, just uh, we've got a couple actually. Uh, um, so uh, Helen Rose has asked, um, how accurate uh, are the predictions uh, of uh, an AI system like Squirrel AI, uh, such as uh, the content mastery and, and things like that? I mean, uh, that obviously kind of uh, varies depending on the, the, the um, on what content the mastery um, um, uh, prediction was made. But I would, um, I can easily say that the accuracy levels of these kind of relatively standardized content acquisition type of tasks um, is a, a very, very, very high um, in terms of predicting the mastery of the content um, um, in structured domains. Whereas if a similar system was implemented in a domain in which there uh, are very uh, many open-ended tasks in which the success criteria and the, the domain model, the, the, the content graph is not very clear, um, then the predictions and their accuracy will be very low. But this um, maths context and the systems like Squirrel AI have very, very high um, predictive power. Okay. And um, and um, Carmel uh, has um, has just uh, suggested. Um, so you were talking about uh, transforming um, between contexts. Uh, so she wondered why 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 would you say it was difficult to transform between contexts, as you had explained? Yeah, I mean there are so many things happening there, but just to um, make it very short for this particular example, um, every single um, course that was studied in this particular um, uh, uh, study um, had relatively different 
um, um, learning design and uh, 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 different requirements from the learners. There was no standardized way of uh, designing the course content, um, which I think played a very significant role. For instance, if the instructor or lecturer um, um, sets up the, their module um, in a way that students are encouraged to complete uh, their problem solving tasks, uh, their interaction on the system with this problem solving task will probably be a significant factor uh, whether they will um, pass the, the module or not. So learning design plays a very important role there. And in this particular study, um, there was no clear standardized uh, learning design, um, which made uh, it almost impossible to transfer the models built in one course to be implemented in another course. That's uh, probably the main, main reason. But there might be so many other things going on there from the learner's point of view as well. Um, uh, so context plays a very, very big uh, role there. But very good question. Thank you, that, I think that's it for the time being. Sure. Brilliant. I'll now, it's with great pleasure, uh, I'll now uh, uh, leave the floor to Timo Hani. Um, for those who do not really know uh, uh, Timo, um, he has a very strong CV and uh, we don't really have time to go through all of these, but he was previously um, a director of nature.com, a consultant in uh, McKinsey and Company, writer for The Economist, um, and a research uh, neurophysiologist at the University of Oxford and Waseda University in Tokyo. Uh, he will show a few examples of how data is currently utilized in practice in educational organizations. So Timo, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Mithu. That's very kind of you. I think you're, you're controlling the slide for someone that's not me, so I'll, I'll just mention when we need to look at the next slide. Yes, so as Mithu uh, described earlier on, um, uh, I'm the founder of School Dash. I, um, uh, we, we use data to help people understand education, uh, particularly in the UK, but beyond as well. Um, if you just look at the next slide, there's a few examples of the kinds of organizations we work with. So everything from, uh, you know, from uh, big vendors to uh, uh, academic societies and charities to uh, schools and trusts and, and government uh, organizations as well, um, and, and media organizations. Um, so I'm gonna give three just quick examples of, uh, of Cases that I think point the way to what's going to be possible and interesting as AI becomes more pervasive in education. So these three examples are not don't actually use AI. So, but they're things that are out there at the moment. They're things uh, in two cases, things that we've been directly involved in, and things that you can go and have a look at and try out yourselves. In some cases, maybe you are using them already, uh, and I find them sort of interesting or useful examples of, of the sorts of things that are going to become more possible as AI becomes more pervasive uh, and more widely used. Um, and in particular, of course, AI both requires lots of data and generates lots of data. And as a data guy, I'm interested in what we can do with that data beyond uh, the AI sort of immediate use of it. Um, so this example was some work we've done with Hodder. Um, uh, so well known as a big education publisher, they have uh, one of their businesses, RS Assessment, provides primary school assessment tests. Um, and I think it's an interesting example of where we can get more visibility on uh, how children are progressing or not progressing during their school years. So, you know, the situation in England that many of you will be familiar with, I'm sure, is that, you know, in terms of the sort of national levels, um, consistent and publicly available test results, we have uh, kids typically tested at age seven, at age 11. Um, so sort of uh, near the beginning or well, sort of middle-ish of their, of their primary years and then at the end of their primary school. And then of course, they're not tested again after that until age 16 and again at age 18. Um, and so um, that's useful. Um, um, and we've done quite a lot of analysis of, of, of national level uh, primary assessment test results. But it leaves a big swathe between age seven and 11, and indeed before age seven, that we can't unpack. You know, you have to do special bespoke research in order to be able to understand that. And so we made use of the fact that Hodder, through our assessment, had been gathering literally millions of test results from across the country of their, their assessment tests that are used by schools every day to test their kids on reading, writing, and maths, um, and typically apply to every kid at every term. Um, and also not in just in those three areas, reading, writing, and maths, but within each of those areas, there's a whole bunch of different strands, different topics within those areas. And so we did a large scale analysis with Hodder. We published it in a white paper. In fact, we published a couple of white papers with them now. There's a URL on that slide where you can go to a blog post where we report some of the findings and link through to, to the white paper itself. But to give you a flavor, we were able to look, for example, at the, the passage of, of um, 
uh, of uh, attainment uh, of different, different uh, topics within maths, for example. So not just looking at maths attainment, but looking at different topics within maths and looking at how, on average, disadvantaged versus non-disadvantaged, some are born versus other pupils, girls v boys, um, were progressing. And for example, we found um, changes uh, by gender during the, the, primary, the primary school years uh, were differential according to which area of maths you're looking at. So, so boys tend to, on average, pull slightly ahead of girls during their primary years. They start off pretty much the same, and then boys pull ahead, but only in certain areas of maths. And that wasn't, that's not, um, obvious from the, the publicly available data where you've only got uh, data at age seven, at age 11, and it's not unpacked into different topics within maths. But we were able to do that because each kid is being tested every term through their primary years uh, and, and tested in different uh, topics within maths. Um, and so I think this is an example of something that's going to become increasingly popular, uh, uh, possible and hopefully popular, um, whereby uh, with AI systems, with the kind of adaptive learning systems that Mutu has been describing, We'll be able to not only look term by term, you'll also almost be able to look minute by minute. And we'll not only be able to look down by individual pupil types, but literally by individual pupil. Um, and so this is the kind of thing where it's going to learn, it's going to lead to a much, much richer understanding of the learning pathways and the learning characteristics um, of children. And it's also incidentally going to be incredibly important in understanding things like summer learning loss and you know, even more pertinent than what right now. Um, the kinds of uh, loss that we assume is happening to learning at the moment uh, as a result of the coronavirus lockdown. Um, so this is something that people are working on actively now, uh, particularly the kinds of organizations like HODA, there are others, Renaissance and, and, and GL Assessment, those kinds of organizations that do mass scale testing and have very large data sets. But this is gonna become much more amenable to analysis and there's going to be much richer data available um, as uh, adaptive learning systems of the kind that we described uh, are adopted. So that, that's sort of one example, that's, that's around pupil attainment. Let's, let's look at another example quickly. Um, so this is about pupil wellbeing. So this is an area that particularly interests me. Um, many people express that this is an important area, that we don't only want kids to do well in their tests, we want them to be happy and well-adjusted individuals. Um, but really, relatively speaking, precious little is done about measuring this sort of thing. Right? We know in exquisite detail how happy online shoppers are. Uh, we know how happy people who are queuing up at airport security queues are, what, back in the old days when we used to queue up at airport security. <laughs> um, and, and, but we really know very little about how happy uh, kids are at school. Um, there are a bunch of organizations that are involved in doing this. We've worked closely with Educate. There are other organizations, Edurio and others, who run uh, surveys as well. This is an example of um, a pupil wellbeing survey that Educate ran, and we've been involved in working with them to analyze the data during lockdown. Um, but, but I just use this as a, really, as a way in to say that I think one of the opportunities of, of having kids engage with digital systems, again, of the kind that Mutley was talking about, is being able to assess not only their attainment levels, but also their state of mind, um, their, their happiness, their motivation, their engagement. Again, Mutley spoke to this earlier, you know, and this is not only about explicitly asking them how happy you are, it can be that, absolutely. That's the sort of thing Educate do, it's the sort of thing they've done in this survey but it can increasingly become be, being more sort of um, non-explicit, right? So, so looking, uh, you can have intelligent systems that engage them um, and infer what their state of mind is or how happy or motivated they are. Again, the kinds of things that we were talking about earlier, he talked about engagement, um, even you know, things like eye gaze and so forth, right? These things are all possible, at least in principle. So one of the things I think I'm really excited about is we're going to be able to tell, um, how happy and motivated and well-adjusted kids are, or at least we're going to have some data to be able to help us understand that um, in ways not only that affect their learning, but affect their, their overall well-being and their overall, uh, the overall you know, kind of uh, likelihood of them turning out as well-adjusted, um, productive members of society and, and happy individuals. So it seems to me this is an important and very rich area as well. Um, and then we'll just look at a third area that I'll just propose as an example. So this is not something in which we've been um, directly involved, but I, I did meet the, one of the key researchers behind it, Janet, Janet Clinton at the University of Melbourne and, and spoke with her about it at some length. And it's something that really interests me. So this is, and they're not the only people working on this kind of thing, but, but uh, it's a sort of representative example. And I think they're doing among the most interesting work here. So this is an, this is an app that will record the activity of what's going on in the classroom and provide the teacher effectively with feedback, statistics on you know, how much discussion was there, you know, what, what's the level of engagement and so forth. And, and one can see that 
has um, audio, um, our capabilities of AI to process audio uh, moving on in leaps and bounds, driven not least by, by intelligent assistants at home and all of those kinds of things, uh, Amazon Echo, uh, you know, Google Home, all of those kinds of um, intelligent uh, assistants um, are getting increasingly good at uh, discerning human voices, even being able to tell multiple uh, voices apart, being able to infer um, uh, what kind of conversation is going on, what the mood of the people involved might be, and so forth. And one can see that this can provide really useful feedback. And, and in the context of, of um, teaching, I'm not a teacher and I've never been a teacher, so I'm completely, I, my comments are, you know, take, take them with a pinch of salt. I'm naive on this, I, I, I appreciate. But it seems to me that teaching, whilst it involves interacting with people all through the day, is in a certain sense a lonely pursuit, in the teacher's usually on their own in the classroom with the kids. And the possibility of peer to peer learning is relatively limited um, by time, if nothing else. Um, and, um, and it seems to me that this kind of, you know, one of the things we should be concerned about is who's teaching the teachers and how are teachers able to improve. Um, and it seems to me that this is the kind of thing that can give objective, non-judgmental, private feedback to teachers to enable them to, to improve during the course of their, their work. So I think this kind of thing is also really promising. So those are the three examples I wanted to raise. One on, on, on sort of classic attainment type things, another on people well-being, and a third on, on teachers themselves improving as a result of uh, AI type feedback. Brilliant, Timo. Um, I'll go back very quickly to Roland if uh, there are any questions for you specifically, and if there are not, I've got quite a few so we can discuss these uh, in detail further. Roland? Sure. Um, so, uh, Helen's asking um, essentially, uh, I suppose, in response to uh, what Timo was presenting, uh, do we think that um, we need uh, to help more people in education to actually understand uh, the data? So what, what Timo was uh, presenting is, is extremely important, but you know, there is a question that some people find that data, even when visualized, you know, what seems like quite simply, they might find it incredibly difficult to understand or interpret. Yeah, it's a great question. I think you know, this, is, this is the problem with all data analysis, I, and I consider it my job as a data guy to try and solve that problem. In, in effect, that's what School Dash exist to solve. Uh, we're certainly not the only ones. But you know, I created School Dash when I realized how much publicly available data there was about schools, never mind AI, but since the coalition government, so particularly in England, since the coalition government in 2010, the government's been pumping out lots and lots of data about schools and, and other areas of, of societal and governmental activity that, that pertain to education as well. Um, and it's just very difficult to make sense of it. Right? There's so much of it, it's in diverse forms. Uh, there's, in educational measures, there's all kinds of issues around how you interpret the data and what the definitions are and so forth. And then the measures change uh, because the, the method of data collection changes, for example. All of this is really complicated, even before you get to actually say, well, what do the numbers say, right? You know, so um, so um, there's not a simple answer to it, unfortunately. Um, all I can really say is that I think it's super important that we have to solve this problem. Um, I think um, uh, you do need people who not only understand statistics uh, and the right kind of maths to use, but understand the domain to some extent. So, you know, mm -hmm. I spent the last five years since I set up School Dash trying to understand the education system. I kind of understand coding and data analysis and so forth, but I, but I really wanted to understand the context in which, you know, to understand what the important questions are and where you see signals in the data, try and understand what that means from a, you know, what, what are the consequences of that, right? Does, does that mean we need to do anything different or is there some sort of spurious reason for the, for the, for that. And then the third thing I'd point to is, I think data visualization has like an incredibly important role here. So it's not enough to give people the numbers, you have to present it in a compelling way that kind of connects with them. And that's something we put a lot of effort into. It's one of the things that I hope we do that's exceptionally good. But the reason for that, we put a lot of effort into visualization, indeed interactive visualization, is to allow people to see the data in a way that sort of viscerally connects with them. They understand what's going on, right? If you're talking about regional differences, show a map, right? If you're talking about differences in average, show an, a, an appropriate kind of, you know, column diagram, or whatever. If you're showing about correlations, show a scatter plot showing you how much or little it correlates. But right? there's, there's ways of thinking about these things that mean that, you know, you need to sort of come up from all the numbers and then present something largely visual um, that helps connect with people. But I, there isn't a simple answer, unfortunately, but through that combination of domain understanding, you know, um, uh, and, and sort of rigorous analytics, 
and, and, and compelling visualization, I think we can get to a good answer. If I may chip in very briefly here, um, um, to, I mean, that's an excellent question and your answer is absolutely very comprehensive as well. I think um, from my point of view, obviously we need uh, you know, you know, data literacy training, we need uh, graph reading training for people, and these, these are important things. But one of the main problems um, in helping educators um, um, to be able to make better sense of these visualizations and, and the data has been that the fact that they have been treated as the um, consumers of, of these uh, products, these visualizations, these models, um, uh, rather than actually creators of, of these um, visualizations, these um, um, models, these um, um, interpretations. And there are at least uh, three different stages there, right? One of them is what do we want to make visible uh, within a visualization? You know, what, what do we want a visualization to show? Um, what do people get out of it, what, they, what is the meaning out of these, what is being presented, and uh, what is the accountability uh, um, uh, uh, out of these meanings that have been uh, generated from these visualizations. And I think all of these, uh, at least three dimensions, should be co-created uh, with the end users, teachers, uh, uh, and, and representative teachers, not those who are already interested in data and you know, uh, uh, trying to, um, uh, uh, we're doing uh, some kind of DIY kind of visualizations on their own teaching anyway, with representative teachers. And uh, uh, perhaps one uh, really uh, thing that uh, uh, I'm very proud of the work that we are doing here is that we take um, co-creation at the heart of uh, the modeling work, heart of the any kind of AI work and the visualization itself. Thanks, Milo. Um, so uh, we've got another question in here um, from uh, Rohit, one of our regulars uh, in the series, and um, he's um, he's talking about uh, data science, uh, the education of data science in schools. So he's asked, what implications uh, do we see for the inclusion of data science education in schools? Could it help in fostering agency uh, among the students themselves in, in terms of using the data that has been gathered on them to design their own learning path? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so, so as a data guy, um, it's, I'm certainly not going to suggest that we shouldn't uh, teach more data science in schools. I absolutely think we should. I think that, um, why is that important? I, obviously, there's the narrow parochial view, which is I think data science is super interesting and important, and we need more data scientists in the future. Um, um, but I think there's an even more fundamental reason as well, um, which I think is, you know, Rohit, sort of implicit in your question, right, which is that I think um, data literacy is a fundamental form of literacy that you're going to be, you're going to need and to have to be an effective member of society, right? And that, that's partly around what data is gathered on you, right, and what are the implications for that, right? So understanding what information other people and other organizations know about you and what they may or may not be able to discern from that information. Um, if, uh, if you, you know, there's lots of talk about people being able to take control of their own data when you, you know, the big social media companies, the big web companies in particular, talk about people, uh, but also in health and in other areas, but you talk about people, you know, have, being able to exercise autonomy and being able to exercise control over their own data. But if you don't understand, um, how data are captured and how they're analyzed and what the implications can be, it's very difficult to make good decisions on your own behalf. And, and so that's quite apart from, you know, the fact that we need more data scientists in the future, right? I think just to be an effective, well-engaged, well-informed citizen, and in order for us to have a, a properly functioning society that doesn't get into all sorts of problems over data privacy and misuse of personal information, I think we need to have a well-informed citizenry. And that, that includes, I think, a basic form of data literacy so i think everyone should have it but i'm a data guy so, so i would say that so i'm, I'm perfectly you know willing to admit that i'm that i'm biased I, I don't know if that answers your question right here but it's a really really good one well i think i think there is i think there is definitely something in there as well just for sort of operating in in society really because if you think about you know just going on social media and news sites you know people mislead with statistics they cherry pick with statistics you know there's a lot there's a big argument to be made for people just being more informed about how to, you know, determine what data, you know, has come from where, what's true, what isn't. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a sort of, as you say, it's, it's going to become more and more necessary. I mean, it's necessary even now when we're looking down the barrel of, 
you know, elections. So it's a yeah. sort of vital thing to know. Yeah, um, I completely, completely agree. Yeah, we don't, uh, we've, we've actually come to the, the end of the questions, um, chat. So um, unless, um, unless you've got one, Lou, or you've got one, Timo, for, for the other one <laughs> in the room, uh, then... Uh, I uh, I'm very, I mean, we've we got a few, a couple of minutes left, but I'm quite interested in, um, Timo, uh, hearing um, your um, uh, opinion on um, uh, 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 one particular question, really, that, um, I mean, we have been, because of the content of the webinar, uh, a lot more focusing on the promise uh, of data and promise of um, AI and what we, what educators and what education can learn from. Uh, data and AI. Um, and I think we made uh, strong points there. But I'm quite interested in hearing from your point of view, what do you think are the kind of current challenges um, for the wider adoption and, and use of AI and data in education systems? Yeah, so, so what's, what's, what are the barriers to adoption? I think, I, I mean, there's several of them, clearly. Uh, the ones I would point to in particular are um, the systems aren't always yet good enough. I think we as technologists have to admit that, right? So uh, mm. we're still playing this game of technologists who don't always understand a great deal about pedagogy and education, creating systems for use by people, students and teachers who don't understand a great deal about the technology that's being used. So I think there's a, there's a job of education, sort of no pun intended, on both sides actually. So one is the people creating the product really understanding that how they can be useful and, and, and then the other side is the people using them, understanding how, how to make best use of the technology. So we're sort of in the throes of that. And it reminds me a bit of, you know, I'm easily old enough to remember, and I've worked in the sort of early days of the web in the late 90s, early noughties, um, where you see the same sort of thing playing out in scientific research and online publishing, in online commerce. Um, you, know, it is, you know, it requires everyone to explore the possibility space of what's useful, and what can people adopt quickly and you know uh, and 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 try and there's a sort of journey of co-discovery between a bunch of different players who have different perspectives and different expertises and i think we're seeing that play out in education as well um, so i do think uh, technologists who understand uh, education better um, and i think uh, but i do think another important part of it and i think this has become particularly apparent during uh, during the lockdown at least for me personally is uh, teachers and schools understanding better how to make use of technology so like in many cases we've all been thrown in the deep end you know i've been learning how to do homeschooling i think i see lots of the teachers i interact with learning how to use technology effectively uh, that they're not familiar with um, and hopefully this can all be a learning experience and we can come out of it the other end uh sort of better informed and better able to make use of it than we, when we came in um, but i do think there's still a big learning process for the people building the products and the people using them the other thing I point to, and you know, it comes back to, to what we were just discussing, is around um, justifiable concerns, ethical concerns, right? Around how the data, how the technology is used, you know, how the data in it will be used or abused, uh, whether there are um, implicit biases in it, what degree of transparency is desirable and even possible in these kinds of systems. These are all, um, uh, you know, live questions, um, and I, you know, your colleague Rose Luckin has been involved in setting up the Institute for Ethical AI in Education. Um, they and others are doing incredibly important work mm -hmm. on trying to create a framework for how people should think about what the limitations of these systems should be and how they should be used and who, who should be in control of them. Um, and there are justifiable concerns about that that I think are, are also a bit of a break on progress. Thank you, Timo. Thank you very much. I think that's about time. Robert, I leave it to you to wrap it up, please. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks, everybody, for coming along. Um, yeah, as on the slide, uh, if you need to email us uh, or get in contact with us, please visit uh, educateventures.com or uh, email help at educateventures.com. Um, we've got a, another session uh, on Thursday at uh, 4 p.m. Uh, British Summer Time. Uh, and that will be with Professor Ben Dublet, uh, and he will be uh, touching on uh, more of the uh, business side. Uh, but as um, he's been developing uh, his own slide deck, as, as Mutlu has uh, developed his own slide deck for this session, uh, the session's likely to be quite different. So we do encourage you to come along. Uh, I've put the um, I put the link in the in the chat uh, there as well, but. If you go to uh, our website, you can, you can pick up the link there to register. Uh, and we'll hope to see you on Thursday. And if not on Thursday, 
Uh, actually, also, just to let you know that um, step seven is going to be in September, isn't it? So um, we're actually taking a little bit of a break for summer because we believe that most of you guys will be on, on a break. So uh, we'll advertise step seven for educators and for businesses uh, when it's uh, ready uh, in September. Uh, and hope to see you then. Um, take care, everybody. Thanks, Timo. Thanks, Mulu. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.